welcome to the last day of the stats unit before review. And today is kind of a practice day too, but I wanted to do one more day where we kind of put all the concepts together, do some region style questions, and make sure you understood what you were supposed to, especially from the second half of the stats unit. So anyway, let's start with what we did yesterday. Um, try this warm up. Lily finds data on the internet about carbon dating. Lily loves carbon dating. You, everyone knows Lily's a big carbon dater. Anyways, the following table shows the years since an organism's death and concentration of carbon-14 atoms in the organism. Which time, or I should say which type, not time, which type of regression would be best to model this situation? Okay, so we want to figure out what type of regression or what type of equation this scatter plot would look like. And that's kind of what we focused on yesterday. So go ahead, pause the video, do some L1, L2 work, look at the scatter plot, and tell me what type of graph do you think Lily should use? So give that a shot. All right, you ready to see it? Okay. So hopefully you went to stat edit. And in L1, you put all the years since death. And in L2, you put the amount of carbon-14 atoms remaining. And then if you go to zoom 9, I mean, assuming that your stat plot's still on, so go to second y equals, plot 1 should be on, and we want the type to be scatter plot. If I go zoom 9, you get that type of shape. So what type of graph would best model this situation? And for your work, you can show your scatter plot. Something like this. And I can see some of you might say quadratic, but we don't expect the amount of carbon-14 atoms to go up again. It's probably going to level off and just keep going this way. So the best type of regression model would be an exponential regression. So exponential should be your answer. Now this one didn't ask you to actually make the um, equation, so that's it, exponential. And your random fact of the day, giraffes can lick their own eyes. You know what color their tongues are? Black. Okay, so today's stuff is a little bit different in that this is also your homework. So all you need to do is take good notes during this video. Um, hopefully you're able to print it out, but if you weren't able to print it out, just write your answers on a separate sheet of paper so that I know you watched the video. And send me a picture of this exact note packet. There's no separate homework packet. And once you're done with the video, you're done with the homework for today. So let's go for it. Again, these are all regions types questions, and they're kind of multi-part questions. So usually it would be like four pointers on the regions, but questions that you should be able to answer based off of what we've done. Number one says 72 students are randomly divided into two equally sized study groups. Each member of the first group, group one, is to meet with a tutor after school twice each week for one hour. The second group, group two, is given an online subscription to a tutorial account that they can access for a maximum of two hours each week. Students in both groups are given the same test during the year. A summary of the two groups' final grades is shown below. We know that first symbol is the mean, and the second one at S of X, we don't usually use that one, but that is the sample standard deviation. So think of this as standard deviation if you see that. Okay, um, it also might be helpful to say which is which. The first group is meeting with the tutor. So this is the tutor group, and this is the online subscription group. Now notice, even in the problem setup, they say 72 students are randomly divided. Remember, if you're setting up an experiment, you need to use random selection. So if they ever ask you to describe an experiment, like that toothpaste question from a few homeworks ago, you have to always say the groups are randomly split up, or participants are randomly split into two groups, something like that. All right, so this is kind of what we did on day 10, the comparing two groups thing. Part A says, calculate the mean difference in final grades. They want you to do group one minus group two and explain its meaning in the context of this problem. Okay, so we're just taking the mean difference. The difference is going to be 80.16 plus 
minus 83.8. And if we do that, 80.16 minus 83.8, we get negative 3.64. So if I do group 1 minus group 2, that means on average, the participants in group 1, the tutor group, scored 3.64 points below the students in group 2, the online group. So this means on average, the students who met with a tutor scored 3.64 points lower because it's negative than the students who studied online. Okay, but we said back when we compared two groups that just doing that isn't enough. Just doing that says, okay, it looks like the online group did better. But is that actually statistically significant? Is it just by chance? Is that not that big? Three points, 3.64 points isn't a huge difference. Is it a big deal or not? That's what a simulation can help us with. So the simulation was conducted in which the students' final grades were re-randomized re 500 times. The results are shown below. Okay, so this isn't a dot plot, but it's like it. It's a histogram. And there's 500 student scores, or 500 differences of groups, I should say, represented here. So remember what this does is this, you have, I don't know how many groups there are, 72. So there's 36 students here, 36 students here. Initially, the groups are split by tutor and online, but now we're taking these 72 students and just randomly putting them into two groups of 36. So in those random groups, some of them had tutor, some of them had online. So these other pairings, these other groups, we'd expect the difference to be clumped right around zero because about some, probably half of them are online, half of them are tutor. It all have about a, the same average, so the difference would be about zero. So we want to know now, is this difference from negative 3.64, is that going to be significant? It says use the simulation to determine if there's a significant difference in the final grades. Explain your answer. There's kind of two ways to do it. So our difference was negative 3.64. We can't see exactly where negative 3.64 is on here, but if you look, it's kind of going by 0.5s. So negative 3.64 would be somewhere around negative 3.5 and less. So just these two little bars. This one I'd say, if you look at this scale, is about 11. This one's maybe 3. Sorry, not 11. 11 would be way up here. This is like maybe 6. So 6 and 3. So it looks like there's maybe a total of 9 people represented that are three point, negative 3.5 or less. So one way to do it would be to say the difference of negative 3.5 or less. And again, the reason I'm looking at negative 3.5 is because where our difference would fall, negative 3.64, only occurs roughly 9 out of 500 times. And let's see, what is 9 out of 500? Point one zero one eight. So one point eight percent of the time. Do you think that is statistically significant? Well, one point eight percent is a pretty low percentage, and generally we think of less than five percent being pretty low. So we can assume a difference like this one calculated here, the negative three point six four, is probably not due to just random chance of how the groups were formed but are due to the actual treatments. So 
since this is pretty rare, the findings are statistically significant. And probably not due to random chance. Okay, so that's one way to do it, just counting how often it occurs. Another way to do it is to look at are you within the range of plausible values? So the range of plausible values, we usually look for that mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution, but they don't give us that. The mean we can assume is in the middle. So what would we assume the mean is here? We would assume the mean is about zero. Do you remember how to estimate standard deviation of a sampling distribution? Remember that's that whole range divided by six thing. So you look at the highest value, which is... 4.5 and the lowest value which is um, negative 4.5 so 4.5 minus negative 4.5 divided by 6 and we went over why that works earlier in the unit it's basically using the normal curve so this would be 9 divided by 6 and 9 divided by 6 I believe is 3 point or 1.5 Okay, so another way to answer this question would be to take a look at the range of plausible values, the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. In this case, that'd be 0, 0.0 plus or minus two times 1.5. So the range of plausible values is between plus or minus 3.5. We would say anything within plus or minus 3.5 is not statistically significant because it happens 95% of the time. If it's outside that range, it's pretty rare. So we could say statistically significant because negative 3.64 is outside the range of plausible values. So that means it doesn't happen often, so it's probably happening because of the treatment that's given and not just by random chance. All right, so that's how you use a simulation to compare two groups, one that gets a treatment and one that doesn't. The next page is another simulation. Joe's Crab Shack is considering expanding its menu to include a vegan section. The restaurant will move forward with this option if at least 17.5% of their customers are selecting the vegan options company devised a simulation based on the requirement that 17.5% of Joe's Crab, Crab Shack customers will select the vegan option. The graph below represents the proportion of customers who select the vegan option, each of sample size 90, simulated a thousand times. So this is based off of the fact if 17.5% really is the true population, if I pick a random sample of 90 and do it a thousand times, what proportion is going to be part of that 17.5 percent? Or what proportion is going to prefer vegan? So again, this is a histogram rather than a dot plot, but if there were dots, how many dots would there be? A thousand. So a thousand, think of that as your number of dots. So what's the 90? number in each dot so number of samples per dot that's so what I mean by that is I take 90 people I ask I see what proportion of them prefers vegan then that's a dot and then I do another 90 and another 90 and another 90 and I do that a thousand times okay it says 90 customers are randomly selected and their menu selections are recorded 14 selected the vegan option, find N and P hat. Okay, so remember what these terms are. N is always sample size. 
so what would n be here? It would be 90, because each sample size is 90. It's not the number of dots, it's this individual sample size. And p hat is the individual sample proportion. In this specific sample we're talking about, 14 out of 90 for the vegan. So if I do 14 out of, oops, not 19, 90, It might help to see it as a proportion. So let's type into the calculator. 14 out of 90. 0.15 repeat. About 15-ish percent, 15, 16 percent. Okay, so that's that. It says assume the set of data of a thousand sample proportions are approximately normal and that the restaurant wants to be 95% confident of its results. Find the margin of error and the interval for which the proportions are plausible based on this simulation. Round all answers to the nearest hundred. Okay, so if you see 95% confident, they're talking about plus or minus two standard deviations. So that should be one hint. They want two things. They want the margin of error and the interval for which the proportions are plausible. So these are two very similar questions. Margin of error is plus or minus two standard deviations. Plausible interval is taking the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So it's essentially the mean plus or minus the margin of error. Remember that those kind of go hand in hand. But watch the difference. Okay. So those two standard deviations, that's when this matters. There's a standard deviation, 0 0.040. So the margin of error is just plus or minus 2 times 0 0.040. And if you do that, you're going to get plus or minus 0 0.08. So the margin of error is plus or minus 0 0.08, or 8%. So the plausible interval means you take the mean of the distribution, which was 0.175, which is what it should be, because it's based off of that fact, 17.5%. 0.175. You can either say plus or minus 2 times 0 0.040, or just use the margin of error, 1.175 plus or minus 0 0.08. And when I do that, 0.175 minus 0 0.08, so minus the two standard deviations is 0 0.095, and 0.175 plus 0 0.08, so plus the two standard deviations, 0 0.255, 0 0.095, 0.255, and watch it did sit around in the nearest hundredth. So the range of plausible values would be anything between 0 0.01. Did I write that right? 0.175. Wait, wait, yep. Yeah, one second. Sorry, yeah, my rounding was just off. So point oh nine five would round to this would round this up to point one zero. So it's between point one zero or ten percent and point two five five would be point two six or twenty six percent. There's your range of plausible values. Okay, so make sure you notice the difference when they ask for margin of error versus range of plausible values. Part C, does the sample proportion obtained, 14 out of 90, fall within the margin of error? Justify. Well, we said 14 out of 90 came out to be 0.15 repeat. And 0.15 definitely falls in this range of plausible errors, which means it does fall within the margin of error. So it does fall. within range of plausible values. So it does fall within the margin of error. And then finally, despite the p-hat value calculated from the sample of 90 customers, Joe's Crab Shack still wants to start the vegan menu. 
describe how the simulation data could be used to support this. So this is where the stats come in. Just taking this one sample of 90 people, 15% prefer the vegan menu. That doesn't meet their qualification of at least 17.5%. But by doing this simulation, what it does show you is that if the true population, if everybody who goes to Joe's Crab Shack really does, there's 17.5% of them that prefer the vegan option, it's pretty plausible that you could get one random sample where only 15% do. That's not unlikely. So this is why the simulation data could support this. If the true proportion of Joe's Crab Shack customers who prefer the vegan option really is 17.5% or 0.175, it's plausible that a random sample, that one, I should say random, of 90 people could have a same proportion of p-hat value of 0.15. So that's why you shouldn't abandon this idea. If your sample had 9%, maybe you don't do it, because then it's probably unlikely that the true population proportion is 17.5%. But if your p-hat value or your sample proportion is anywhere between 0 0.10 and 0.26, it's very likely that the true population proportion, or at least plausible, that the true population proportion is that 17.5. Okay, so I know I'm kind of doing a lot of talking, but I'm hoping that you're seeing how these simulations could be used. Another way, reason why Part D is what it is, basically you're saying, is it within the range of plausible values or without? Or is it within study's margin of error or not. It is. Okay, so hopefully you really understand simulations at this point. Last page. All right, number three is in, doesn't have anything to do with simulations, but it's a kind of tricky question, and I'll show you why. Ten teams competed in a cheerleading competition at a local high school. Their scores are shown in the table below. How many scores fall within one population standard deviation from the mean? what percentage of teams fell within this range. So we've got to figure out the standard deviation and the mean. So how do I usually do that? One variable stats. Now, this is where it's tricky. Look at the table. What are you going to type into your calculator? You're not going to type in L1 or L2. The team number isn't a statistic. It's just a way to label them. So they're kind of misleading you by showing you a table like this. This is not a frequency table. not a frequency table. Don't do L1 and L2. All we're going to do is we want the average and standard deviation of all these team scores. So all of these are just going to go in L1. Okay, so if I go to stat edit, I'm going to clear out stuff from the warm-up and just put in all these team scores. So we've got 29, 28, 39, 37, 45, 40, 41, 38, 37, and 48. Okay, so then we're going to go to stat calc. One variable stats. Again, we're going to put in L1, but make sure that you leave the frequency list. L2 blank. 
because this has nothing to do with frequencies. These all occurred one time. Okay, so we're going to go to stat, calc, one variable stats. We have L1. I don't want anything in frequency list. And hit calculate. And the mean is 38.2, and the population standard deviation is 5.88 if we do nearest hundredth. So mean is 38.2. Standard deviation is 5.88. So they want to know how many scores fell within one population standard deviation. So take the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. So if I do 38.2 plus or minus 5.88, this is not the margin of error. This is just a different question talking about within one standard deviation of the mean. So 38.2 plus 5.88, the upper level is 44.08. And 38.2 minus 5.88, lower level is 32.32. So 32.32 to 44.08. And it wants to know how many scores are within here. So 29 doesn't count, 28 doesn't count, 39 is good, 37 is good, 45 is too big, 40 is good. 41's good, 38's good, 37's good, but 48's too big. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we got 6 scores. And then it also asked what percentage of teams fell in this range. Well, 6 out of the 10. So 60% of the teams fell within one standard deviation. Back from Algebra 1, find the interquartile range. Do you remember what that is? Well, that's if you divide up by the four lowest, the four next lowest, the four next lowest, and the four highest into like four quarters, what's the range of quartile 3 minus quartile 1? So basically, how big is the middle set of data? That's back in one variable stats. So if I go back to one variable stats real quick, like... The quartiles are listed if you go down. So quartile 3 is 41. Quartile 1 is 37. So 41 minus 37 means the middle amount of data has a range of 4. The middle 50%, essentially. 75% minus 25%. Alright, so that's just kind of some holdover from Algebra 1. And then lastly, we've kind of done a question like this already. But I wanted to do one more normal curve question and show you when you use these scores versus when you don't. Okay, it says two versions of a standardized test are given, an April version and a May version. The statistics for the April version show a mean score of 480 and a standard deviation of 24. And the statistics for the May version show a mean score of 510 and a standard deviation of 20. Assume the scores are normally distributed. Claire took the April version and scored between 510 and 540. What is the probability to the nearest 10,000th that a test paper selected at random from the April version scored in the same interval? Okay, so they do say assume the scores are normally distributed. Remember when you see that, you should go back to this normal curve stuff. So we're talking about just the April version here. So you draw your normal curve. In the April version, we've got a mean of 480. Where does that go? right in the middle, and a standard deviation of 24. We want to know what's the probability you could score between 510 and 540. Okay, well 510 would be up here, maybe 540 is over here, and I want to be between here. Do you need z-scores for this? No. That's how I taught it originally, but that was just before we learned the faster way in the calculator. I originally taught you to do this with z-scores so that you could see how this relates to the parent normal curve and see where those percentages are coming from. But now when you have a question like this, you should not be doing z-scores, and a lot of you still are. You should just be doing normal CDF, 510 to 540, 
with a mean of 480 and a standard deviation of 24. So you go to your calculator, quit out of that, we'll go second VARs for distribution, normal CDF is choice two, lower value is 510, upper value is 540, with a mean of 480 and a standard deviation of 24. And it calculates and you get 0 0.099440. So the nearest ten thousandth is four decimal places, one, two, three, four. So it's about 0 0.0994. Okay, no Z scores necessary. Part B is where you would use Z scores. Holly took the May version. And what interval must Holly score to claim she scored as well as Claire? When you're comparing two different tests that you want to normalize and see what the results say about each other in comparison to one another, that's the only time you would use a z-score. Okay, so to do this one, we got to compare z-scores. Okay, so we want to know what scores would Holly get that would mean the same as 510 and 540 relative to the test she took. Okay, so let's first look at Claire. Claire took the April test. The April test had a mean of 480 and a standard deviation of 24. We just saw that. So Claire's interval of 510 to 540, let's see what her z-scores would be. Her lower z-score would be 510 observed minus the mean, 480, over the standard deviation. Okay, so let's remember what z-scores do. It's the observed, so the value from this study, minus the mean over the standard deviation. So if we do that, 510 minus 540, hit enter before we divide by 24, you get 1.25. So her lower z-score, she's 1.25 above, standard deviations above the mean. The upper z-score, would be 540 was her upper value, so 540 minus 480 divided by 24. So 540 minus 480, hit enter, divided by 24, and you get 2.5. Okay, so that's the interval that we, that's our, our target interval. So now we got to check on Holly. Holly took the May version. So in May, the mean was, what's it say, 510 with a standard deviation of 20. So the overall average was higher for Holly. So if she got 510, she would have just been average, whereas Claire was above average. So we want to see what scores did she need to get to have these same z-scores as Claire. So we need her first z-score to be 1.25. What would she need to score? Minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And her second z-score needs to be 2.5. What would she need to score? Minus the mean over the standard deviation. Okay, so we just have to solve these two equations. So if I multiply both sides by 20, I'd have 1.25 times 20, which would be 25. So 25 equals x minus 510. So add the 510 over, and you get 535. Let's do the same over here. So 2.5 times 20 is 50. So 50 equals x minus 510, add the 510 over, you get 560. Okay, so the range of scores that Holly would need, Holly must score in the range 535 to 
560. So she has to score a little bit higher since her test maybe was a little bit easier given the mean to be as good as Claire. Okay. All right. So hopefully you understood all of that. Some good review for the test that's coming up. This is your homework. So show me these completed notes and you are done with today's work. Have a good day.